Imagine what right. someone might have thought um, who was a refugee reading The Very Hungry Caterpillar, which is about eating your way through the days of the week, the biggest selling picture book of all time. Um, and part of the reason is it's got counting in it, it's got days of the week, it's got colours in it, it's got foods. Also, it's got holes right through the middle of the book where children could put their fingers, which is exactly why the mini book of The Very Hungry Caterpillar doesn't work because the designers were very smart and realised that in the original size book, the finger size hole that the worm eats its way through, the caterpillar eats its way through the book, is exactly right for a child's finger. But the book ends with this wonderful transformation. That to me is an indirect and positive giving image for a child who's feeling a bit lost, a bit ordinary, bits the future hold for me. The future here holds a glorious butterfly at the end of this yes. journey through those days of the week and through those foods. This is one of my absolute favourite picture books, the English illustrator Pat, illustrator Pat Hutchins. Pat Hutchins died recently and it's a huge loss. She first published Rosie's Walk. Now, that was back in 1967 and it's a wonderful book. And speaking of wordless storytelling, it's about Rosie the Hen, story Rosie's Walk, it's about Rosie the Hen walking across the farmyard and on every page, there's a fox following her. And the fox is just about to get her when it steps on a rake or it falls in a pond or something like that. And Rosie seems completely unaware that this is going on. And I've always wondered about that book, whether Rosie is just a complete moron and she doesn't realise that there is a fox behind her who's going to eat her for lunch. Or if Rosie's really smart and she's very kind of smug and she knows that there's a fox behind her, but she knows that this fox is not so smart and will step on the rake and will fall in the pond and so on where she just sails over it and gets home in time for lunch. This book started the whole concept of a divided consciousness in storytelling for young people. And there have been many examples since, but this is the book that I wanted to show you. And it's called When the Doorbell Rang. I love this book. Grandma has made some cookies and she's made, I think, 12 or 24, I'm just forgetting. And that means that the children sitting around the table divide them up and they go, great. So if there's 24 and there's four of us, then there's six each and the doorbell rings and somebody else turns up, two more friends turn up and they go, mm, gee, okay. So if there's 24 cookies and there's eight of us now, then that's three each. And so they're about to tuck into their three cookies and then the doorbell rings and more friends arrive <laughs> and the number of cookies each one gets goes down until there's one cookie each the house is so full of kids and friends and they don't know what to do they're about to bite into it and the doorbell rings and this is the second page and it says the doorbell rang and rang and you know and rang means because they're just thinking do we scoff it down quickly and pretend we didn't have any cookies at all or what do we do and they finally, it gets the better of them, their good nature, and they open the door. And it's grandma, and she's got another 24 cookies. <laughs> this book was produced, this is Britain, this is the UK, in a period when they were very conscious of the growth of multiculturalism. The crowd keeps gathering, there's always enough cookies. And then at the end of it, grandma, which wasn't Margaret Thatcher, but grandma comes with another tray of cookies for everybody. What I want you to notice, though, is the floor. Here's silent storytelling black and white. It's perfectly clear what this theme of this book is about. And Pat Hutchins, without pointing the lesson, makes sure that you never forget the black and white alternation with a bit of brown footprinting there also. So we know it's about multiracial Britain, but that's never the topic of the book. So that's what I mean by pictures and design being able to tell stories. The definition of picture book as a genre is that the, while complementary, the word text and the picture text are not identical. That there are, there are elements in the picture text that are not there in the word text. Now that's something added or something taken away. But that's what a picture book is. If you're thinking of literal illustration of a word text, that would be what I would call an illustrated book. But the picture book always has elements in the pictures that are not there in the, in the words. Why is that important? because it gives the child the opportunity to explore the book for herself and to feel empowered. I saw something you didn't see. That's the thing, you know? How many children during a boring talk like this are sitting there on the floor noticing that your socks don't exactly match and that you've got a thread hanging from the bottom of your jeans? And if I pulled that, 
what might happen to the seam of your jeans and so on. Children are natural storytellers and fiction creators and they love that. So to notice this when you didn't or appear not to have is just ace. That's the top sort of situation in storytelling for a child. So we've strayed back into subtext and explicit and, and suggested and so on. This is a really great Indian picture book and it's the, the kind I was referring to before. Gatila, who is a cow who's black and she doesn't like black. It's boring. So she goes around the farmyard and she looks at all sorts of animals and she makes sure that she changes her own colour. Here, I think she's been looking at a bee. She looks like a tiger more than a bee to me, but anyway. Uh, and she tries all these different colours and eventually she goes, no, nah, I think I was better black and it rains and all the colours wash off and she's black again and somebody sees her and says, oh, Gatilli, you're so beautiful. I love that black colour. I'm throwing this out to you. What's this about in Indian culture at the moment? Why are there so many books like this? It's really interesting to me. Because, and it's interesting to me because Australia, like the United States, is a multicultural society, but at the moment, some extremists under economic pressure are testing that out and wanting us to reverse it. But you've always had a diverse society. Why would you be needing to apparently be reminding yourself of, you know, diversity being a good thing? And that if you happen to have black skin as a cow, then that's a good thing. Don't wish that you were something else. Fascinating. Anyway, maybe you've got a view on that. Owl babies. Again, the art style is really beautiful here. And, and here's a story about the mother flies away and the baby owl, the littlest owl, thinks that they've been deserted. This is what I say about trying to approach something indirectly. If I were dealing with a child who was feeling a bit lost or a bit lonely, or maybe a refugee child who wasn't feeling at one with the culture, this would be a good book to leave lying around. Because the story this tells is, your mum is coming back. She had to get some food for you. Don't worry. It'll be all right. And we're here anyway. You're not alone. You've got a brother and a sister here. So what is the behavior that we want to help change? I think there are all sorts of answers to that. Here's a book that I totally love, Wonder. Uh, it's been made into a film with Julia Roberts in it. It's a fabulous book. It's the first novel by RJ Palacio. And it's about a boy who has craniofacial difference that he's born with and has had multiple operation. And he still says, no matter what you think I look like, I can guarantee you it's worse than your worst imagination. His mother protects him, his father protects him. They homeschool him because they're afraid that if they let him go to school, he won't survive, that the other children will just be too nasty. He does eventually go to school. And maybe the most touching scene in the book to me is it's Halloween and everybody dresses up and this is the best day of the year for him. He thinks it's wonderful because he won't be recognized. He can wear a sheet over his head and he can be a ghost and he can go in there and join with all the other people who are in costume. And he does that and he goes up as a ghost and the other kids don't know it's him. And he sees a group of his best friends chatting and they're saying how hideous he is and how scary his appearance is. And he's just devastated. Devastated that the kids he thought were his best friends. The truth of the matter is they find him frightening. It's a book that comes around in a circle and he comes to accept his appearance and the other kids come to accept that appearance too. Um, it's a kind of story about difference for older children and about coming to that. For older children, I mean, I've chosen a serious example there, but please don't underestimate the value of laughter. That's in Australia, the top writer for older children is Andy Griffiths. And that's because Andy Griffiths is hilarious, full on funny, just laugh out loud funny. I think that those stories do translate into the Indian situation because I've seen them for sale in Mumbai. They're very funny and a little bit cheeky, but you know, and it may be that if you had them in this shop here, one or two parents might come in and say, this is disgusting, I don't want it. Um, but there's a bad book and then there's the very bad book. That book, some people, it's very unusual for children's books to hit the front pages of the newspaper, but one bookseller in Sydney, Sydney's top bookseller for young people said, this book disgusts me so much. I feel like vomiting. I don't even want the book in my shop. It's so bad. What they didn't realize was that it's actually a book about bad parenting because Andy Griffiths has been um, criticized for being truthful and for not sort of being sweet 
There's a story there called the very, 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 very bad story. And it just starts off and it says that one day things were really good and then they got badder and badder and badder and badder and badder and badder. And it goes on page after page with just the word badder. <laughs> <laughs> printed, I think it may be about 10 pages of the word batter in, and the designer has made the words really big sometimes and really black and really bold, you know. There's another story which I love called Kittens, Puppies and Ponies and even that title tells you what this is about. It's about a kid in the school who wants to write about killer robot chickens from outer space but the teacher always gives the prize to the child who writes about kittens, puppies and ponies. And it's really revolting. So he decides one day to write a fake story about kittens, puppies and ponies. And <laughs> it doesn't win the prize. In fact, somebody steals his idea about killer chickens from outer space, killer robot chickens from outer space, and the teacher gives the award to that story and says, this is the most moving story I've ever read, you know. <laughs> so Andy Griffiths is just playing around with the, the way that adults look at children's literature um, versus the way we do. Yep, oh, love that book. I Really Want to Eat a Child. I Really Want to Eat a Child is a really fabulous book about a little crocodile whose mother gives it food but it won't eat it. And the mother says, I've made this fantastic cake for you. And the child says, mm, I really want to eat a child. And the mother tries everything. So the child, go, the crocodile goes down to the river and actually finds a child. But the pictures, uh, the trick is in the proportions because when we see this crocodile, we, the, the story pans back out and we see that the crocodile's actually about that big and the baby's that big. You know, there's no way he can ever eat the baby. But he thinks all his Christmases have come at once. It's a very funny book and about perception. This is a great book, Australian book about... Uh, about difference, physical difference. Uh, it's called One Step at a Time and it's about an elephant that steps on a landmine in this Asian country. And this boy helps the elephant by making a prosthetic leg for the elephant. Um, it's beautifully designed. It's told with a great charm and, um, and sensitivity. And again, is an apparently indirect, you know, if you, if you were to give that book... <laughs> to somebody who had a prosthetic limb, it would be too didactic. But this is an adventure. It seems to be just a weird story about, oh my God, the elephant stood on a landmine, what are we gonna do? And the kids apply their inventiveness to it. It's a really beautiful book. I hope you get a chance to see that.